Welcome back to a Filmography of One, the show where we talk about the careers of directors who made one great movie. And you know, we've talked a lot of recent stuff on this show. I mean, I would never do anything this decade, because it's very easy those directors are going to come back. But we have talked about a lot from the 90s and 2000s, and there's maybe a small chance that those people are going to come back after like a 20-year hiatus. So let's go back, way, way back, to the 1800s. Okay, 1899, the year Charles Lawton was born. Yeah, Gary Oldman wasn't the only actor to work as a one-time director. Charles Lawton got his start acting in the late 20s. He'd have noteworthy roles in films like Island of Lost Souls, Mutiny on the Bounty, and The Private Life of Henry VIII, for which he won an Oscar making him the third Oscar winner we've talked about on this show. In 1949, he would appear in the film Man on the Eiffel Tower with Burgess Meredith. Producer Irving Allen began directing the film, but after three days of filming, Lawton demanded that Meredith take over as director. To help Meredith with the load, Lawton agreed to direct the scenes Meredith was in, though he didn't receive a screen credit for this. So technically, he has directed more than one movie, but it was an uncredited co-director gig, so we're not going to count it. Still, this, along with Lawton's time directing theater, gave him the experience he needed to direct his own movie. And after reading the 1953 novel Night of the Hunter, he decided what movie he was going to make. Lawton served as producer and hired James Agee, the Oscar-nominated writer of African Queen, to write the script. It's about a prisoner named Harry Powell, a man who pretends to be a pastor, marries old widows, and kills them for their money. He gets arrested driving a stolen car, and while in jail, his cellmate, Ben Harper, tells him about $10,000 he had stolen, and the only person he revealed the location of the money to was his son, John. Ben dies in prison, but after Powell gets out, he tracks down little John and his sister Pearl. Once again posing as a pastor, Powell quickly charms the townspeople and marries Ben's widow, only to kill her and make it look like she had run out on him. But John and Pearl are onto his scheme and run away with Pearl's doll, where the money is hidden. I'll stop there to avoid spoilers, but there's a lot of plot in this movie for an hour and a half long film. This is not a slow movie by any means. It goes a lot of different places, which makes it a really unpredictable film. Especially since so many of those places are places most movies at the time wouldn't go. The movie is creepy as hell. Powell is a very threatening villain, due in large part to Robert Mitchum's eerie performance. He can be perfectly charming when he needs to be, but he turns on a dime to a straight-up madman. The child performers aren't bad either. They're no Oscar winners, but for child actors who basically carry the back half of the film, they're acceptable. Other performances include Oscar winners Shelley Winters, James Gleason, and a brief appearance from Peter Graves. I'm Peter Graves. It's almost hard to describe the movie. It's not like anything else. It's one part crime, one part thriller, one part slasher. It's one of the most entertaining and original movies I've ever seen. And this may well be the most highly regarded movie from a one-time director, even more so than Carnival of Souls. Roger Ebert discussed it in his Great Films series of essays. Empire Magazine ranked it number 71 of their top 500 movies. And not to be outdone, Kaj de Cinema called it the second greatest movie ever made behind Citizen Kane. It holds a 99% on both Rotten Tomatoes and Metacritic. The impact of the film is obvious watching it. Many scenes have inspired other similar moments in later films. It even started the trend of having love and hate knuckle tattoos. But, uh, it wasn't always that way. The film wasn't understood in its time. It was poorly received both critically and commercially. It was panned by both the New York Times and Variety, and generally ignored by audiences. This was probably a Big reason Lawton never made a second film. But I don't think that was the only reason. See, in the early 50s, Charles Lawton's acting career was not doing great. In fact, he wanted to play Powell in this movie, but he got talked out of it by producer Paul Gregory because he thought no one would want to see a movie starring Charles Lawton. But just two years after this film's release, he was in 
witness for the prosecution, for which he was Oscar-nominated. Three years later, he was in Spartacus, and just two years after that, at the age of 63, he died of gallbladder cancer, just seven years after his directorial debut. He was back in the acting business and gone just as quickly. I feel like, given some more time, or maybe less success acting, he might have come back to the director's chair. I don't know that Lawton ever got to see his film find its audience in his time, but it's certainly found a place among cinephiles today. The film has received placement on so many greatest movies, greatest villains, and scariest movies lists, I couldn't even mention them all here. Criterion did a Blu-ray release of the film, and it's been preserved by the Library of Congress and the National Film Registry. So on top of a very impressive acting career, Charles Lawton has left behind a brilliant directing filmography of one. I'll see you next time.